chemical and biological arms control at the internet treaties at the international level are one of the key tools that uh, we use to establish an international norm to control the weapons of mass destruction proliferation. Uh, today I want to introduce to you Mr. Michael Moody, the president of the Chemical Biological Arms Control Institute. I first met Mike in 1998 at a European conference where he was the moderator. The subject of the conference was the implementation of the Chemical Weapons Convention, uh, how to strengthen the Biological Weapons Convention, uh, and then also to look at the validity of the United States' cruise missile attack on a pharmaceutical plant in Sudan. Uh, these types of issues are not foreign to Mike because he's actually been involved in over 25 years in international security issues at the government level, in academia, and in the uh, policy community. Mr. Uh, Moody's uh, education comes from Lawrence University and Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. During the 1980s, uh, he was involved uh, with ACTA, uh, he was a, well, he was a special assistant during the 80s, I'm sorry, to the ambassador uh, and a special assistant on projects at the U.S. mission to NATO. And during this time, he worked primarily on conventional balance of weapons between the Warsaw Pact and the Allied forces, also on conventional arms control. In the 90s, he was confirmed by the Senate and sworn in as an assistant director to the multilateral affairs of the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Uh, during this time, uh, he also worked with conventional arms control, but also chemical and biological weapons and in confidence building measures. Uh, he has also led in multiple delegations and represented the United States government uh, at the Chemical Weapons Convention meetings and the Biological Weapons Conventions. Uh, he has been a senior research uh, analyst at several policy organizations uh, such as the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Institute of Foreign Policy. It's a real pleasure to have uh, Mike here today. Uh, his organization that he's president of, the Chemical Biological Arms Control Institute, uh, has its focus on the elimination of chemical and biological weapons. And his goal is to promote a goal of arms control and non-proliferation. With that, uh, I hope you'll uh, give a warm welcome to Mike Moody. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. This is a couple of firsts here for me. It's the first time that I've had an opportunity to visit the university and to interact with the students and the the faculty here on, on your home turf, although we have met at some other occasions and in some other fora, but it's a great thrill for me finally to have the chance to come down and, and visit the university in, in your home ground. Secondly, this is the first time I think that I've ever had a class in a TV studio, which is kind of <laughs> new and different, and that's uh, kind of an added, added benefit. I appreciate very much the comments. I was asked essentially to put together a two-hour lecture presentation, but you're going to get the most out of this if you interact with me and I can interact with you. So please don't hesitate to interrupt with questions. I hate to hear myself talk. I'm sure after a few minutes you will too. So I would very much welcome your comments. And if I'd, I'm not really quite sure if this takes two hours, takes 20 minutes, or three hours. But I, we can throw it all away if what you want to do is talk about a set of issues that are of most concern to you, while maybe covering a little bit of the arms control dimension. Uh, it is, I, I will admit, to being part of the arms control mafia. I had, had been in a variety of cases, and then sort of formally when I was at the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency back in the first Reagan administration. My job there as Assistant Director for Multilateral Affairs was to supervise our work, which was responsible for all of the non-nuclear negotiations that were going on in the arms control arena at that time. So we got involved in initially the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty and the confidence building measures that were being discussed in what was then the CSCE in Vienna, 
We also had responsibility for any of the disarmament work that the United Nations was doing, including the work of the First Committee, which meets in the fall, part of the general preparations for the General Assembly, uh, the Disarmament Commission, which meets in the spring. The after we finished CFE, which was fairly early in the administration, much of my time and attention turned towards the negotiation and of the Chemical Weapons Convention, a treaty that bans chemical weapons. And that's uh, part of what I'm going to talk about today. It was an incredible experience for me to be part of the team that made that happen. It, it is something concrete you can point to in, at the end of your career and say, I was I was part of that, and I think it did make an important contribution to the environment. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to end your class on the arms control and nonproliferation side of things, because I think it's important to keep in mind that arms control is part of the toolkit that we have to promote a, a safer and more secure environment to deal with some of the security challenges that we will be confronting in the 21st century. And it is important, uh, it, some people would give pride of place to arms control as the way to deal with problems of chemical, biological, nuclear, or even conventional weapons. I don't see it that way. Certainly my colleagues in the administration during that period in which I served didn't see it that way. Arms control is part of a broader toolkit that has to be made to work with the other tools that we have at our disposal. And many of those are things that you have covered in the course of your class here. The important thing about arms control, the fundamental reason that it is important, is that these agreements embody the global norm against these weapons. And that norm serves an enormously important function. It is the, the reason we can go after the bad guys. It serves as the basis for mobilizing international action. It serves as the standard against which to judge the behavior of others and to uh, be able to isolate and then work against those people who are violating what is generally agreed to be a global norm. And it is that fundamental embodiment of these norms that arms control does and which is why it is important to sustain the effectiveness of these agreements over their lifetime. So uh, it may be a starting point on the one hand, but it's also, I think, a very good place to finish because at the end of the day, the norm provides the basis for doing everything else that you've talked about today. What I've done is broken my presentation into three parts. The first part talks about chemical arms control. The second part looks at biological arms control. And then I've got a very short section at the end that looks at the export controls regime primarily through the mechanism of the Australia group, which is that um, informal agreement among like-minded states to coordinate their national export, export controls in the chemical and biological area. As I said, as we go through this, please don't hesitate to ask questions or to pursue something or to tell me you think I've I'm, I'm been smoking something I shouldn't have if uh, you violently disagree. Uh, don't have to really review. I, I didn't quite know all that you have done or where in your class you're, you were, so some of the basics about what chemical weapons are. Uh, the, um, the history, though, is important because arms control activities historically deals with is, is done in a historical context. It, it is part of the unfolding of events and in some cases pressures to do things in the arms control arena relate to other things that were happening. So I think it's important to review briefly to provide some of the historical context for some of the more specific arms control activities a little bit of the historical background. Obviously chemical weapons came to prominence in the modern age during World War I and the enormous psychic impact that that had among a, a generation, especially of Europeans, but also here in the United States. The, the advanced generations of nerve agents were developed before World War II, but curiously, World War II did not witness any chemical or biological weapons. There are a number of explanations for that. Uh, in part, some people suggest that because Hitler was gassed, 
in the First World War. He had an aversion to using gas. There was also the threat of retaliation because all of the, partic all of the major participants in World War II had ongoing chemical and, in most cases, biological weapons programs at all as, as well. But for whatever reason, chemical and biological weapons did not make an appearance during that conflict. I, I phrased this about sort of post-World War II specifically because chemical weapons were never very much of a visible part of the discussion of the Warsaw Pact NATO balance in Europe. It was nuclear and conventional and not a lot in between. When, in fact, there was concern among NATO forces about Soviet capabilities. And I remember when I was at NATO, we got a briefing from some of the military people down at SHAPE headquarters who argued that if the Soviet Union used chemical weapons during a conflict in Central Europe, their capabilities would be degraded by something on the order of 65%. And it was for that reason that the United States, and to some extent its European allies, pursued a chemical weapons program of its own to have the ability to threaten retaliation in kind against Soviet forces so that it may have been a way of evening the playing field. And there was an element in the strategy of flexible response that addressed chemical weapons use, but it was never a very serious public uh, part of the discussion of NATO strategy and the ongoing uh, confrontation between NATO and the countries of the Warsaw Pact. But it was there and, and kind of always lurking in the background. It, I, f I find it ironic given what I did later, that my first major introduction to the chemical weapons issue was when I was at NATO. And what I was doing was working with my ambassador to try to get our European allies to support the decision at the time in the, in the mid-1980s when the United States decided to go ahead with a binary chemical weapons program. And we were trying to sell it to our European allies. And, as, and it was a very, very tough fight. And I remember giving a briefing to members of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and, and on a very quiet basis, sort of what the US thinking was behind this. And the chairman of the committee uh, told his members this is a quiet, not a, off the record briefing. And then the next day on the front page of the International Herald Tribune, there was my briefing and I was quieted. So that's a measure of you got to be careful when you're dealing with politicians. The other aspect of the, the post-World War II environment were allegations of use of CW uh, on some occasions, uh, the most prominent of which are generally recognized use of CW by Egypt in the Yemeni Civil War in the early 1960s. There are allegations that the Soviet Union used chemical weapons in Afghanistan, although those are not as generally accepted as perhaps the Egyptian, the allegations of Egyptian use. And then, of course, there was the major undoubtable uh, use of chemical weapons by Iraq in its war with Iran uh, in, the, in the Persian Gulf during the mid-1980s. There's a little bit of a question about Iranian use. Um, the British, for example, see this issue differently than we do. The United States basically argues that Iran did use chemical weapons at the end of the war in part to, again, as, as part of a retaliation in kind against the Iraqis. I know there are other countries who do not necessarily share our confidence in the evidence of Iranian use, but it is clear that Iran had made the decision to pursue chemical weapons option after there had been a dispute in Iran as to whether or not Islamic law allowed the use of chemical weapons. And on the first, in one hand, initially they said that it did not. And as they continued to suffer from the consequences of Iraqi CW use, uh, the mullahs overturned their position and allowed a CW program in Iran to go forward, but they claimed they never got beyond the research and development stage or weaponization, but that they never used it. Uh, an ongoing debate about that question. Bringing us up to date a little bit, most US officials argue that about two dozen nations possess 
CW capabilities, the ones that are most frequently cited by name, are identified on, on this chart, uh, largely of concern in the Middle East and, and East Asia. Um, it's going to get a little warm in here, so if you... I notice you don't have Cuba up there. I'm sorry. No, that... I know, I I'm sorry, have, table two. Yeah, I, I notice you don't have Cuba up there. Uh, the whole Americas seem to be totally devoid of chemical weapons. Is that true? The re the, I, we came up with this list by looking at a variety of unclassified studies and saying among these studies, these, there was agreement on this set of countries among X percent of the studies that, that had lists of sus suspect countries. Cuba didn't make that cut because it was only identified in a couple of studies as a possible CW possessor. And in fact, I think there is probably greater concern about Cuba as a BW possessor. Cuba has a very, I won't say cutting edge, but certainly relative to other countries of the non-aligned movement, a, a much more advanced biotechnology capability. Apparently, they have one of the best bi advanced biotechnology facilities in the world that American drug companies have actually gone down to look at as a possible production source. Mm -hmm. So I think Cuba is more of a concern from the bio side than the chemical side. With respect to the rest of, of Latin America, I don't have a slide in there, but I'll, I will talk about it. They have made some very active efforts and led on a regional basis in terms of regional efforts to eliminate chemical weapons that has been quite successful and, uh, and people point to as a model for other regions to pursue. In light of the events of September 11th, I don't think we can ignore the other dimension, which was the ter is the terrorist dimension of this problem. And the best example we have in this regard is the Om Shinrikyo. It's important to remember that it was a very big organization very well funded. They made an active effort to recruit young people with scientific backgrounds. They were global in scope, some of the places where they had their activities. And they conducted a number of operations. Uh, the first one, and in fact, this got my institute into the business of looking at chemical terrorism. We were invited to examine uh, about th four months after the attack in Matsumoto which occurred in the summer of 1994, where there was a release of a gas that killed some judges. And, and there was suspicion at the time that it might have been the Aum Shinrikyo because those Japanese judges were about to make a decision, a legal decision that would impose some penalties on them. We made the conclusion at the time and sent a, a rather quiet report to our friends in the government at the time that as one, ex one explanation consistent with the evidence as we understood it was that it was a possible preliminary test for a larger terrorist attack sometime later. And in fact, unfortunately, that was a, an analysis that proved to be correct because in March of 1995, the Om Shinrikyo attacked uh, the Tokyo subway with sarin gas. It was a very simple operation, both technically and operationally, they had these five groups on three different subway trains that all converged at the subway station that is sort of the center, it's, it's like Federal Triangle or, or one of the places in Washington where the government buildings are. They put sarin-filled pouches sarin, in a liquid form, they put the pouches on the train in a, in a plastic bag that was inside a, a brown paper bag. One of the people put the bag on the train, another person with a sharpened umbrella came by and punctured the bag full of sarin, and essentially they let it evaporate. Not a particularly effective dissemination device. Nevertheless, they, the, the attack resulted in 12 fatalities, over 500 injured, some of whom are irreparably injured with things like brain damage. The interesting thing about it was over 5,000 people showed up at the hospitals that day or, and, and in subsequent, um, which is an example of the kind of psychology that you might have to deal with in the event that there is attack, an attack somewhere else. Well, that's all by way of background to get into what I'm really supposed to be talking about, which is arms control. Uh, chemical arms control has a long history. 
going back to the Hague Conventions of 1899, 1907, uh, beginning with the prohibition of asphyxiating gases in the Hague Declaration of 1899. I had mentioned World War I and, and the relationship between those events and arms control, and here's an example of how World War I and the trauma that the gas attacks in that conflict had sparked interest in doing something about that capability and it led to the 1925 Geneva Protocol which basically prohibited the use of chemical and biological weapons. But there were some serious problems with the convention. First of all, a number of states parties who agreed to that also put on a reservation which you are entitled to do in a legal international legal instrument of this kind, essentially saying that if chemical weapons are used against us, we reserve the right to retaliate in kind. So that, in a way, reduced this prohibition really to a prohibition on first use because it was clear the countries were saying, if it's used, all bets are off. Secondly, there were no provisions for verification, no provisions for enforcement, no discussion of penalties if there were violations of a rather large gap. And finally, finally the, the protocol is silent on all the activities that you need to make chemical weapons. Even if you can't use them, it was perfectly legal, even with the protocol, to engage in research, development, weaponization, stockpiling, chemical weapons production. All the protocol did was prohibit use. But it was a very important beginning, and it served as the basis then for ongoing discussions. I'm not sure that it really contributed very much to the lack of use in World War II, but then in the late 1960s, the issue, maybe because of what happened in Egypt or the Egyptian use in Yemen, maybe for some other reason, the issue of chemical and biological weapons was placed once again on the international agenda. I would note that the United States did not join or, or adhere to the Geneva Protocol, I think, until 1975. It took us 50 years to get on board that particular convention. And when we did, we put a reservation on it with respect to r retaliation in kind. But in 1968, the issue was placed on the agenda of the Conference of the Committee on Disarmament, which was the forerunner of what is now the Conference on Disarmament, which is the only multilateral arms control negotiating forum in the world. People describe it as the UN Conference on Disarmament. It's not really a UN body, although it's affiliated with the UN and it gets its support from the UN and, and operates out of UN facilities. Nevertheless, it, it is not quite a UN body, does not have universal membership of the UN and so on. Uh, but at this point, too, the issue of chemical and biological weapons was, was separated, and they then pursued separate tracks, and we'll get onto the bio side a little bit later. 1984, then Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush uh, went to Geneva, where the CD sits, and offered a draft treaty on chemical weapons. Uh, and that became the basis for what was then called the rolling text uh, and that served as the basis for the ongoing negotiation to conclude the treaty. Two other dates that I have up here that I think are important are September of 1989, there was an agreement between the United States and the then Soviet Union on a, member, on a memorandum of understanding uh, between James Baker and Edward Shevardnadze at the time which was designed to exchange information on our respective chemical stockpiles. And shortly thereafter, in June of 1990, we and the Soviets agreed bilaterally on a procedure for moving ahead with the destruction of the stocks on which we had shared that information. Both of these things were done in the context of the ongoing negotiations in Geneva as ways to facilitate progress in those negotiations. When you've got, uh, uh, at, at this point, the CD had a membership of 40 countries, uh, 
not all of whom were necessarily very deeply involved. But when you have that kind of multilateral negotiation, it can be very slow going. And these two bilateral agreements between the United States and the Soviet Union were intended to move those negotiations forward. And I think they did to some extent. More importantly, however, the thing that really opened the window for conclusion of the CWC was Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and the subsequent Persian Gulf War. Because it turned what had been for many participants in this process a theoretical, maybe interesting, maybe not so interesting possibility into a very real security problem for them. For the first time in a lot of people's memories, we and the members of the coalition confronted a chemical, chemically armed opponent who had demonstrated a willingness to use those weapons in a conflict. And once Iraq was defeated, it really did create a sense of urgency in terms of the importance of finishing the negotiations that there was not a very large window of opportunity created by the end of the Gulf War where you had the kind of psychological predisposition to finishing the treaty that was necessary to get over some of the major stumbling blocks that had slowed the negotiation for several years. So you can see that the CWC has a negotiating history of more than, than 20 years. And, and that mentality, that predisposition, that sort of sense of urgency did prevail so that the CD concluded the negotiations in September of 1992. The treaty was open for signature in Paris in January of the following year. And then it entered into force uh, almost five years later. The interesting thing here is that when the treaty was concluded, and signed, it was anticipated that entry into force would take two years. And so they had a preparatory commission that they thought would be operating for about two years. But there were a whole range of reasons that that process got slowed down. And it took almost five years, in fact, for the treaty to go from the point of signature to the point that the trigger for entry into force was actually reached. Now get, and, and to be quite honest about it, the United States was partially responsible for that delay, and I'll get a little bit into the debate we had over the CWC ratification as well. Any questions so far? That's got, yes, sir. Table six. The, um, who besides the U.S. has um, started really down the road of actually destroying all these chemicals that they've signed up to? We'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Okay. You're, you're jumping ahead. But the, the treaty requires, if you are a party to the treaty and you have chemical weapons, you're required to declare them and to destroy them under international verification. The United States actually began its destruction program well before the treaty entered into force. And we had begun our destruction at Johnston Island in the Pacific in the late 1980s. And a couple of other destruction sites have come online since that time and there are plans to build a, a couple of more. The United States has a stockpile of about 30,000 tons of chemical weapons that has to be destroyed. The other major player in this was the Soviet Union, now Russia, the largest single stockpile holder with a declared stockpile of 40,000 tons. Some people think that that's an underestimate. Uh, and there were a, a couple of surprises in the declarations actually in terms of countries that declared chemical stocks who also now are required to destroy them. But I'll get into that issue a little bit later because there are some problems, particularly with the Russian destruction effort. Table two here, I guess. Sir, uh, why do you think there was no international outcry against uh, Iraq when they used uh, chemicals against Iran or, and the Kurds? That's, that's a good question, and the Iranians keep asking it and, and use it as a justification for doing some of the things they're doing. I think part of it had to do with the fact that Iraq, in the Iran-Iraq war, Iraq was not necessarily seen as the bad guy, and there were reasons to support Iraq or not to get on the wrong side of Iraq. I mean, they're remembering that the Iran-Iraq war occurred, broke out not long after the change of regime in Iran uh, 
it was such a traumatic experience for the United States. Iran, and, and to today, Iran is not viewed particularly friendly towards U.S. interests. And at that point, I think the animosity was even more intense. And so while we were officially neutral in the Iran-Iraq War, our neutrality tilted towards the Iraqis. And that may be part of the reason why we did, didn't do it. The second reason, I think, is, is while people knew what was going on, there, there wasn't a sense of what it really entailed in terms of, I mean, it, it wasn't quite the advanced media images all over the place of, of things. But there were some, it, it, it took a while for the international community to gear up, and there were some things that happened. In fact, what Iraq did was a spur to the creation of the Australia Group in terms of export controls because governments recognized, Western governments in particular recognized that they had helped contribute to the Iraqi CW capability, and that might be another reason. They didn't want to have the spotlight turned on them to say, <laughs> your companies were selling them this stuff and selling them the equipment and helping them develop these kinds of capabilities. Um, so I think there were a number of reasons why that was the case. But just to uh, briefly review some of the provisions of the CWC, what the, what the treaty is all about, it is, I think, the most far-reaching multilateral arms control agreement in history because of the, the scope of it, what it tries to accomplish, and the way that it tries to accomplish that. As opposed to the Geneva Convention, it not only deals with the question of use, but everything with respect to chemical weapons is prohibited by the treaty. Research, development, stockpiling, transfer, uh, acquisition of another kind, and, and obviously use. It bans assistance. You are not allowed to transfer materials or equipment that might facilitate the development of another country's program. It requires you to destroy existing stockpiles and production facilities, past production facilities. Uh, there are very detailed verification provisions. I think the verification annex is, if you put all that is combined in the treaty, the, the, the basic document and the associated annexes. It's a act to put out a, a, a version of it that's about 180 pages of it. About 100 pages of that are the verification annex in terms of the details that are required in terms of the declarations and the associated on-site activities. It does, and, and it, in addition, it creates an organization to oversee that implementation, OPCW, which is now based in The Hague. Uh, finally, it also specifies some penalties for violations, although they are not terribly uh, rigorous. The approach to verification in particular is basically built on two pillars, declarations and on-site activities or inspections. You have to declare, among a variety of other things, whether or not you had a past program, whether or not you have existing stockpiles, and I listed here the four countries that de have declared stockpiles. Uh, US, Russia, obviously everybody knew about those. India was a bit of a surprise. Because all through the negotiations, India said, no, 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 we've never done anything so horrible as this. And then comes the time to get their declaration, and they talk about at least a small research production facility. And South Korea is thought to be, it's virtually accepted to be, it's, it's funny if you look at the, something like the annual report of the OPCW, this is their report for the year 2000, when it talks about destroying declared stocks, it will say the US, India, Russia, and another state party. South Koreans have never allowed themselves in official documentation to be named as that party, but it is generally agreed that they are the party to whom the OPCW is referring. You also have to, and this is, this is where a lot of the ongoing activity of the treaty is associated, you have to declare production, processing, and a variety of other activities with rela related to three categories of chemicals. Schedule one chemicals are th that, and these, these schedules 
were defined by a combination of their utility as a chemical weapon and their commercial utility. So Schedule I chemicals are chemicals that either have been or, or are likely to be chemical weapons use, but have no other commercial activity. So something like sarin would be a Schedule I chemical or VX. There is no commercial value in that other than to be a weapon. So that's Schedule I. Schedule II are the primary precursors for chemical weapons that have some commercial value. Thiodiglycol is an example. It is a precursor for chemical weapons, but it is also used as an ingredient in the ink in your ballpoint pens to make the ink flow more smoothly. So that's Schedule II. And then Schedule III are chemicals that could be precursors or chemical weapons themselves, but have widespread commercial utility, something like chlorine or phosgene. Uh, yes, they have been used as chemical weapons, but they are also very widely used through a, a huge number of commercial activities as a, as a commercial product. So it's not something that you can totally ban. And there are different there are different thresholds of activity associated with each of these that have different requirements in terms of the amount of detail you have to give and, and what it is that the kind of information you have to provide with each of these three schedules. The second pillar of the verification activity are on-site activities or inspections. And there are a variety of different kinds. One is there is continuous monitoring by representatives of the OPCW of destruction activities wherever those are going on. So there are OPCW inspectors sitting in Tuella in Utah on an ongoing basis monitoring RCW destruction program. A second, also they, they also deal and, and inspect the destruction of the production facilities. Eleven countries declared former CW production facilities. But they also have a provision that if you get approval of the executive bodies of the treaty, the Executive Council and the Council on States Parties, you can convert those facilities to some commercial use as long as that conversion process is irreversible. And you have to go through an application process that demonstrates to the decision makers that in fact what you're asking for is an irreversible conversion process. So while you're supposed to destroy the facility, and this was something of very strong importance to the Russians. They said, we are economically strapped. If you make us destroy these facilities, they're gone. Give us the opportunity to convert them to some kind of economically purposeful, useful activity. And so the treaty takes that into account. Then there are industry inspections, because it's basically at industry facilities that Schedule II and Schedule III chemicals are produced. And so a huge element of the treaty is involved in visiting declared chemical industry sites that deal with these scheduled chemicals above certain thresholds. There are two kinds of visits in this regard. One are routine where essentially what you're trying to do is check the accuracy of the, of, the, of the declarations that they made, make sure there are no general problems. Um, the other, and, and the heart in many ways, of the treaty are the provisions for challenge inspection. Basically, any state party can go to the OPCW and say, I want you to conduct a challenge inspection at this facility or at this location in this state party and there's not supposed to be basically any questions asked. They go out and they do that. I mean, it is the central mechanism for trying to catch deliberate violators of the treaty. Uh, it is a, a, a critical capability that has to be in the treaty if it's to have any ability to deal with the proliferation problem at all. And I I'm emphasize that because a little bit later when we get into a discussion of what are certain, some of the current concerns about CWC implementation, part of it has to do with challenge inspections. 
Any questions so far? Uh, essentially, the obligations in the treaty are divided among three or four key sets of actors. I'll just put these up. Uh, you can read them very quickly. Uh, with respect to these are the obligations of the governments who sign on to the treaty, the states' parties to the treaty. Obviously, you can't do CW. You've got to declare. You have to create a national authority, which is the point of contact between your government and the organization on these kinds of issues and with other countries as well. Plus, you have to kick in some money to the OPCW. And they use a modified UN scale, so the United States winds up paying between 20 and 25 percent of the cost. Uh, some more limiting trade, not only with, not with, well, this is important as a way to try to get countries into it. There, now we are at the point in the treaty, five years out, that you can, if you are a state party to this treaty, you cannot trade in scheduled chemicals with a non-state party. So a country like Israel, who is not a party to the CWC, cannot get scheduled chemicals ostensibly from any of the state's parties. The United States cannot provide, even for commercial uses, cannot trade in those chemicals with a country like Israel or Egypt, neither of whom are a state party. You have to, there is a provision, you have to tell the organization what kind of assistance you will provide, uh, and a variety of other things. The organization has some obligations too that were very important. Uh, and, and perhaps the most important was protecting confidential business information. This was a, there was a huge fight about this during the negotiations. Concern of the chemical companies that some of the key things that give them their competitive edge will be lost in the declaration and inspection process. And so handling confidential business information emerged as a very important element in this treaty. And there is a special annex in the treaty drafted in large part by representatives from industry that deals with how the organization has to go about protecting CBI. Uh, it is important, I think, to note that this is the first time in arms control history that these kinds of obligations have been extended beyond governments to a sector like the chemical industry. It's, it has never been done before. And therefore, there was, in the course of this negotiation, this was breaking entirely new ground for these kinds of treaties. Uh, and, and we needed at the time, and we were fortunate to have, a very strong working relationship between the government negotiators and representatives from the chemical industry particularly as they were organized through what was then the Chemical Manufacturers Association. And we were very fortunate that the chemical industry decided it's better to play in this game and get a treaty that we can live with than to try to stay outside of it and criticize whatever the final product was. They came into it with a very clear set of stakes that they felt they had in this process, and they were able over a period, given the extent of the duration of the negotiations to develop a set of mutual understanding with the negotiators. That was true certainly on a national basis within the United States, but it was also true internationally and through U.S. chemical industry leadership, the chemical industries of, of other countries that are leaders in this area also pr proved to make a very positive contribution to the outcome of the treaty. Some, an, an experience that was not replicated in the context of the biological negotiations that we'll talk a little bit about later. Let's, yes, table five, I guess. Yes, sir. Uh, how did the, uh, the negotiations address the, uh, the security aspect of uh, enticing people to get rid of their chemical stocks? We've heard and read about the view that these are the poor man's nuclear weapons, and that brings quite a bi big bargaining chip to any kind of security negotiation. Uh, so now you're, there are virtually 
throwing away the only chip they have with very little chance of replacing that with the nuclear weapons. Well, there, were, there are a, a couple of answers for that. One is several countries weren't honest about their capabilities and what they were doing. And so you had them in the, in the context of the negotiation saying all the right things about how bad this was and supporting the global norm against such weapons and the need for this kind of global ban against these kinds of capabilities when you knew darn well that they were pursuing these capabilities in their home, in their home countries. But it is very difficult for them to come, out, come right out and say that. The United States was, had been very open about its CW program, and to some extent the Soviet Union had been as well. So people knew that, and, and for many of the other countries in this negotiation, the, the, the deal was about getting rid of the U.S. and Soviet stockpiles. So that, I mean, in, in a sense, the CWC as the BWC is in one sense a disarmament agreement because it gets rid of existing stocks. I told you about the Indians. I mean, the, during the negotiations, I can never recall an Indian saying, oh yeah, we've got them too. It was always this sort of, you guys, boy, you gotta get rid of this bad stuff. Um, so, so there is a disarmament dimension to this that in many, for many of the countries who participated in the negotiation was the most important element of it. There is then a non-proliferation part of it that is embodied in the ongoing set of activities with respect to chemical production and the attempt through the process that I've described to ensure that the chemicals that could be used traditionally for chemical weapons don't get misused in some way. And that's why you've got challenge inspection. If you're really concerned, you have the ability to go and say, I think this is a problem. So, but I think that for some of the participants in this who were committed to chemical programs anyway, they felt that they could get around the system. So they, in a way, they were going to have it both ways. They could go along with the international sentiment that abhors these weapons in, in participating in the treaty and all of that. On the other hand, they could run an illicit program and feel that maybe they could get around the kinds of provisions that the treaty actually allows. So, and, and in some cases, I think countries were willing to forego the capability because of the kind of international environment and, and the experience with Iraq, I think also, for some countries that may not have committed to a program, but who may have been in a position to think about it. And this is where I think the Latin Americans, especially Brazil and Argentina, and to some extent Chile, were very important because they didn't have necessarily CW programs, but they certainly were capable. And without the global norm, they might have been attracted to looking at that option. And they decided it's not for us. And so on a, on a regional basis, even before the CWC was signed, Brazil and Argentina led, first had a bilateral agreement that they would forego any chemical weapons capabilities and eventually they were able to extend that throughout the South American region. And that, as I said, was a regional effort that has been used as a model to try to get progress uh, where there is not so much of this kind of mentality, especially in the Middle East, which is still the area which is the biggest hole. I mean, it's a big hole in this CWC donut because a number of the countries which do have programs, according to the U.S., are not members of the treaty. I talked about the ratification issue and the slow time from signature to entry into force. Part of that had to do with the debate in the United States about the treaty. Um, this, this, the Colonel said I had some personal opinions about what you're gonna get now is Mike Moody's version of the ratification debate. Uh, first of all, I think the Clinton administration had an opportunity very early on, no, in, in the summer of 94, to push the treaty through a democratically controlled Senate. 
didn't do it for whatever reason. And they delayed on it for a variety of reasons because they couldn't get the Interagency Act together. So they submitted the treaty for ratification and the Senate took it up in the, in the second quarter, essentially, of 1996, during which time there was a huge problem with it. And I, I attribute four factors to the debacle that was the first ratification debate. One, an uninformed Congress. Despite the fact that people had briefed the Congress on the issues in the CWC forever, they really didn't have a clue what, was, what the treaty was about. And so they found it hard sometimes to distinguish between good information and bad information. This might be overly critical, but I don't think the administration cared very much. Despite their rhetoric, getting the treaty through the Senate was never something on which, in my view, the senior political leadership of the administration was willing to spend much co political capital. Uh, and so it'd be great if it would happen, but we're not going to give it a, a high priority. You also had a group of supporters of the treaty that weren't ready, just with their arguments, with their information, with the kind of information that the Congress really needed. And that became especially a problem because, in my view again, there was also a group of unscrupulous opponents to the treaty who deliberately misrepresented what was in it, who made arguments that were blatantly not true and despite being contradicted over and over and over again, would continue to make the same kinds of arguments. Um, I think that combination of four factors led to a real debacle and, and it led to the administration deciding that before the treaty came up for a vote that they were going to lose, they withdrew the treaty from the floor for consideration uh, at table three and then table one. Uh, big industry chemical companies? No, the chemical industry, in fact, was a very strong label or lobby in favor of the treaty. A lot of the argument was by the opponents had to do with how this would hurt industry and how industry didn't like it. And at the same time, you had guys from the big chemical industries up there every single day saying, this is something we have worked on for the last decade. It's something we have contributed to. We like it, and we want you to vote for it. And that was part of the debate mm -hmm. here at table one. So I'm just wondering, um, if you could give us some kind of, um, like maybe some insight as to what types of people get sent to the conferences to draw up the treaty. Like, are they, are they military? Are they you know, are, are they political or, you know, are civilians, you know, what, what type of people go to, that, that argue about, you know, what should go in and what should go out? And I guess here's the reason I asked that is because on, on a previous slide you had um, the, the out, that some of the weapons that were, they were trying to outlaw, you know, like dumb dumb bullets was one of the ones I noticed. But, I, you know, and then I look on CNN and, you know, you look and see that a B-2 is going to drop a 5,000 pound bomb on people in Afghanistan. I mean, the, we don't blink an eye at that, but yet we'll be mad as I don't know what if we find out in the press that we're using dumb dumb bullets to kill the same number of people. Okay. So I guess I'm okay. thinking, Who, you know, who's you responsible? Know, for yeah, I mean, how do you do, you know, you sit here and go, I mean, does it really matter how you get killed? You know, yeah. so I'm, I'm, well, is actually, there anybody there that, that's talking about actually, that? Actually, one of the reasons chemical weapons emerged back in the early 20th century was because they, there was an argument that it was a more humane way of killing people than killing them with the kinds of things. It, the dum dum bullet was, that was on the early slide that goes back to the Hague Convention of 1899, which at the time they were talking about what was then sort of new military technology. And chemical weapons appeared, even though they, the Hague Declaration also prohibited them, but chemical weapons did appear, at least in some people's minds, because it was a more wet, humane way of conducting warfare. Did not prove to be the case in the trenches of France, but that was some of the argument for doing it in the first place. Uh, as to who participates in the conference, in a, in a, speaking at a military facility, uh, the last word you want to say is diplomats. <laughs> but they lead the effort. And, and clearly different countries have different combinations of resources that they bring to an exercise like this. From the U.S. point of view, we assemble an interagency team that have the, the most critical stakes 
in that. So the interagency team that supports the negotiators would include people, I mean, it, was led, it was chaired by the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, which has been integrated into the State Department in the mid-90s. So they don't exist anymore, but they, they, their job was to do arms control. So in this case, they had the chair for most of the CWC activities. But sitting around the table would be people from state, OSD, JCS, DOE, Department of Commerce, Intelligence Community, um, NSC. I'm trying to think. The, I mean, those would be the main players. And by and large, there would be representatives of each of those entities on a delegation in Geneva. That always overwhelmed a lot of the other participants because they'd say, here's the United States. They've got the resources to bring this kind of expertise in. And, and it would be backed up. I said, there was, a, there was a, a chemical industry working group with which that interagency team worked to get industries input into things. There were scientific advisors, uh, chemists, academic chemists, and so on that who, who would provide technical expertise on, on the subject of the treaty. And um, <laughs> getting a signal here from. Uh, so, so we would have that interagency team, and that mix of people would be reflected in the delegation in Geneva. Other countries would not be able to bring those resources. West Europeans would always have a similar kind of team if not as large. The Brits were very good and, and had a lot of different capabilities. The Germans would be pretty good. The French would be good. Um, the Russians or the Soviets and then the Russians would have a big team like we did. A, a lot of military people on their side. Uh, but then if you get into, especially into the non-aligned countries uh, that are very important in this kind of multilateral process, countries like Brazil, Argentina, Iran, Indonesia, um, they would not have the ability to bring that kind of stuff together, certainly in the, in the delegations on an ongoing basis. And by and large, their load would be carried by diplomats who would be assigned there specifically to do the negotiations. Table four. Can you characterize uh, briefly the, the type of people or organizations that were, your, were the opposition to this? Uh, some of the people were people who were inveterate arms control opponents, never saw an arms control agreement they liked, and this was one more and they thought it was useless. Um, there, w there were some people who reflected some of the smaller chemical companies who had reservations about it, but were not active opponents. By and large, the opponents of the treaty were, were, were people who do not like multilateral activities, and they especially don't like multilateral arms control. And they basically would argue that a treaty like this would create a false sense of security, that it would redirect resources away from ha what had to be done in the chemical and biological defense areas. Um, as, as you can see, and maybe I'm biased since I worked on this, uh, I didn't think they had particularly good arguments, but they, were, they have the ear of some of the political leadership up on the Hill. I mean, one of the key opponents of the treaty in the Senate itself was Jesse Helms, as seen then chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. I remember testifying before Senator Helms on the treaty as a non-governmental official at one point, and he, he thanked, I, mean, there, I, was, I was the patsy. There were four opponents and me, and Senator Helms thanked us after our discussion. He said, I learned a lot even from you, Mr. Moody, so <laughs> maybe I had an impact. Anyway, uh, let me just quickly run through this because I know we need a break. We're almost at the end of the chemical stuff. So they, they withdrew the treaty before the 1996 election. After that was over, they reintroduced it to the Senate and it passed successfully. And then uh, it entered into force on April 29th. The trigger was 180 days after the 65th instrument of ratification was deposited with the UN. 
What's the current status of the treaty today? There are 143 states parties, 31 signatories, which means they, they haven't assumed all of the obligations, but there is an obligation of being a signatory to an agreement that you will do nothing to undermine the object and purpose of the treaty. That's Diplo speak for we're not going to do anything that could irreversibly violate the spirit of the treaty. Um, you know, sort of engage, I mean, essentially a signatory would, would say we're not going to do chemical weapons even though we don't want to assume all the obligations. Or our legal processes for treaty adherence aren't finished or we can't do it or we're too small or we don't care or for a variety of other reasons. All of the Schedule I, which are the CW production facilities, have been inspected. Over 300 inspections, Article VI are the ones that deal with, with the industry sites. Over the last five years, over 300 inspections in 43 states' parties. So there, there is a lot of activity, but activity doesn't necessarily meet success. And there is to be a review conference of the treaty, I believe either late next year or early 2003. And they've got some very serious problems with which they have to deal. I would put the, at number one the problem of Russian destruction. The Russians have only now put into place a program for the destruction of their 40,000 tons of CW. They have a treaty obligation to have it all destroyed 10 years after the entry into force of the treaty. That means 2007. There is no way they're going to meet that obligation. There is a one-time extension of five years that you can get if you go through and get the decision makers to do that, taking it out to 2012. There is no way the Russians are going to be able to meet that deadline either. So here you have one of the central features of the treaty and a situation in which a leading state party is not in compliance. It has missed every destruction milestone so far and it's going to continue to miss them. The reasons for it, they've got funding problems, and they are looking to the international community for help, primarily for financial assistance. Whether the international community gives them the help or gives them the level of help they want is an open question, because the Russians haven't yet demonstrated how committed they are to this. Estimates are the Russian destruction program will cost at least seven to ten billion dollars. This year they're spending 120 million on destruction. You can't get from here to there with that level of funding. Second problem is some U.S. reservations that put on the treaty despite the treaty provision that says you can't put res reservations on it. And these are politically bothersome because they set bad precedents for others. The Senate said that the president could deny an inspection in the United States for national security purposes. It's not expected that he would ever do that. But the problem is others could take the same kind of reservation and use it in a more difficult situation. So how we're going to deal with the US reservations on the treaty is an issue. Challenge inspections. I mentioned how I, I at least see them as critical to this. Problem is they've never been used. And here you have an unusual situation where we, the United States, in our official documents, including DOD proliferation and whatever it is, that publication they do, say in black and white, Iran is violating the CWC. And yet, we have never asked for a challenge inspection in Iran for reasons that I don't know exactly. But we haven't, and so the Iranians come back at us and say, you know, put up or shut up. Either do a challenge inspection or stop talking about it. And finally, there are some issues associated with industry. Uh, maybe now is the time to break. We'll, we'll take, I'll just have one more slide on this, and then we'll get into bio. I'll be quicker on that. So thank you very much.
we'll uh, wrap up on the chemical side here, just a couple of more points. One of the challenges, obviously, is universality. The, uh, one of the objectives is to get everybody in, if you can, and there are some big holes in the CWC. North Korea is one on the East Asian side. Taiwan is a problem because it's not recognized to be a government of a state, therefore it can't join. But the real problem is the Middle East, where a number of CW programs exist and where the, those countries and others are not involved. The, despite the fact that a number of Arab countries, especially the Egyptians, were very active during the negotiations, they decided not to sign the treaty or to become a state party to it. And the reason for that, at least in the Egyptian case, is that they see it as linked to Israel's position on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And as long as Israel makes no move towards joining the NPT, Egypt is not going to make a move towards joining the CWC. There is a bit of a, a mistaken assumption in this position that CW for Egypt and nuclear weapons for Israel in some way may play the same role. And there's also, I think, a mistaken judgment that it gives them a certain amount of leverage. Basically, I think the Egyptians are making a big mistake in the position they've taken, but they've taken it for the last decade. The other problem is that a number of countries, some of whom do have CW programs, are hiding behind the Egyptian position on this. There has been something of a break in the ranks. There has been, there are some Arab countries in the CWC, Jordan, some of the Gulf states, but the key states still are not a part of it. OPCW has some serious funding problems. It doesn't have enough money to conduct the full set of inspections that it wanted to do and had planned to do this year. That's something serious that has to be taken uh, that has to be dealt with soon. I'll talk in the bio context about the, the ongoing tension between the issues of export controls and cooperation and assistance, because what is true in the CWC, also true in the BWC. And finally, there is a broader issue. It's, it's couched in terms of the general purpose criterion, which is Article One of the treaty that says basically anything, any chemical that is used as a weapon is banned for that purpose. But the problem is the advancing science and technology in this area. And this is especially true on the bio side, but it's also true in the chemical arena as well. The science and technology is making a tremendous advance. As I've tried to suggest, the CWC is a very complex, complicated, detailed document. And it's not necessarily one that is gonna be changed easily. Certainly government bureaucracies are not noted for their nimbleness and their rapid reaction to trends and developments. And whether or not the treaty is written in such a way that it will be able to be adaptable to the changing science and technology and that it will apply to where science and technology is 10 years from now is I think a question that a number of people have. Fortunately, one of the things that the treaty creates is a scientific advisory board to the OPCW, and some of the leaders on that particular entity are concerned about this issue, and they have begun to do some work to look at that very question. Skipping. Well, before you leave uh, the chemical, chemical Weapons Convention, uh, I know that OPCW is located in The Hague. Right. About how many people uh, are employed in that organization? They have an organization of between, I think, four and 500 people, about 200 of whom are inspectors, would be my, would be my guess. Uh, there, actually, there was, it is in the treaty that the organization will be located in The Hague, and there was a huge fight about that during the negotiations about whether it would be The Hague or Geneva or Vienna. Uh, the U.S. opted for The Hague, and we won. Some people would say we didn't win because the Dutch government has not been terribly accommodating to some of the things the OPCW wants to do. But they have a beautiful new building there. Uh, the problem is they'll tell you that they're already out, they've already outgrown it and they want more. And that gets into the funding issues. And there are some management problems with the leadership of the OPCW and, and so on. But it's an organization of about four to 500 people, about 200 of whom I think are, are the trained inspectorate. Maybe a little bit more than that. Turning to the bio side, just a quick review, what we're talking about, the use of living organisms, 
the byproducts of living organisms. I like these. I don't know if anybody can identify these. These are castor beans that produce ricin, uh, the toxin that was used to assassinate Georgi Markov, the Bulgarian diplomat who got punctured by the umbrella in London. Why are BW considered potentially the future weapon of choice? In a way, CW is passe, and there are a variety of characteristics that it has. Not least is the strategic impact. If you go back to WHO study of the 1970s that is being updated, go back to a study by the now defunct Office of Technology Assessment in, I think, 1992, um, they suggest that given the right meteorological conditions, biological weapons, uh, anthrax, for example, could produce the same level of casualties as a low-yield nuclear weapon. So there are strategic implications. Uh, for BW. Again, putting this in uh, historical context, BW goes back a ways. Uh, French and Indian War was witnessed in this continent. The 1930s, the central event was the use of biological weapons by China in the war in Manchuria. Uh, there are a number of studies about Unit 731, the Japanese a uh, unit that <coughs> was responsible for their BW program. There is still some lingering resentment to the fact that the leadership of that unit was not brought to justice, but rather was uh, tapped for its technical expertise. Uh, the U.S. program began in the 1930s, or late 20s, early 30s, continued through the war and continued until 1969, the two main facilities being at Fort Detrick, Maryland and Pine Bluff, Arkansas, worked on a number of different agents and as you probably know it was terminated by President Nixon unilaterally in 1969. There are different explanations for his decision uh, and there is some debate about that but the fact is he did it and a couple of other elements just to keep in mind. The Soviet BW program Act also had its origins in the late 20s and early 30s in the military dimensions. But in 1970, about two months, or, or certainly within six months, of the time that they signed the Biological Weapons Convention, Soviet Union launched a second program that turned out, that was intended to exploit advances in biotechnology, separate from the military program. This became the Biopreparat program that ultimately involved dozens of facilities across the country, thousands of people, billions of rubles, and did some very nasty stuff. If you read Ken Alibeck's book, Biohazard, Ken was the deputy, ultimately became the deputy director of the Biopreparat program, and he explains in great detail some of the scientific and technical work they were doing, as well as the way they were thinking about using biological weapons operationally. Um, and, and in part, for example, as a follow-on in the event there was a nuclear exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union. In total violation of its treaty obligations. The other obvious example is the Iraqi program. On the eve of Desert Storm, Iraq had a significant BW program that had examined and weaponized a variety of different agents, had put them into a variety of different delivery vehicles, and this is the one area of the UNSCOMP story after the Gulf War, the United Nations Special Commission on Iraq, that they are very disappointed about because I don't think they feel they ever got the full BW story. They certainly never found any of the biological agent that they knew Iraq was working on. They didn't discover all of the growth medium, and that has led to concerns that with the expulsion of the UN inspector Saddam Hussein has geared up his program once again and is carrying it forward. Just as in the, uh, in the chemical arena there are public allegations about specific countries who may have BW programs, there are some who have declared past programs like the United States, Soviet Union, South Africa is an interesting case, Iraq, Britain, 
pre-war, pre-BWC, 50s and 60s as well. And then a number of countries that are continue to be on the list as to whether or not they are continuing to pursue a BW program. Again, this is drawn from looking at a variety of unclassified sources that have various lists, and, and we essentially put this slide together if you were listed on more than three of the studies. Just to fill out the picture and to keep the terrorist dimension as well, there are a number of cases of biological terrorism or attempted terrorism. Maybe the most successful one was the one that was not lethal, was the use of salmonella in salad bars by the Rajneeshi cult in, in Oregon. They did that in order to affect the, the outcome of a local vote where the local population was not very happy with them as neighbors and they did not want to have the kinds of restrictions that this referendum was going to put on them. They dumped salmonella on a bunch of salad bars and got a lot of people sick. The interesting thing about that was that it was treated as a, as a natural occurring outbreak of disease and it wasn't until two years later when they had arrested one of the cult members for other reasons that they actually admitted that they had been responsible for that particular attack. And our friends in Japan also um, explored biological weapons, um, R&D with anthrax, botulinum. They had at least nine separate unsuccessful attacks with anthrax and botulinum. There are also reports that they sent a mission to uh, Kikwit in Zaire during an Ebola outbreak, ostensibly on a mission of mercy, uh, but the thought was that they were attempting to acquire strains of Ebola at that time, something that, in fact, the Russian program actually worked on. Looking at the biological arena, you see that it, too, has its origins in uh, efforts of a century ago, the same Hague declarations, the 1925 Geneva Protocol, but overall, I think, as, I, as the slide indicates, there wasn't a lot of interest in moving down in this direction, again, until President Nixon's decision in 1969 and his use of the unilateral U.S. decision as attempted leverage to get the rest of the international community to make the same kind of commitment that the United States had just made. That led to what was essentially a bilateral initially a bilateral negotiation between the U.S. and the Soviet Union that ultimately became the basis for the Biological Weapons Convention, which was concluded on a multilateral basis in 1972 and entered into force in 1975 initially. And, and today it has, I believe, 143 states' parties. This is Article I of the treaty, which basically identifies the nature of the prohibitions. And you'll see that it's worded in a particularly interesting way. Agents or toxins, whatever their origin, method of production, of types and in quantities that have no justification for prophylactic, protective, and peaceful purposes. Essentially, what this is doing is, uh, is prohibiting an offensive program. The problem is that it turns on the issue of intent, and proving intent in an international environment is an enormously difficult thing to do. You can have, you can be doing exactly the same thing under the BWC, and if it's intended to serve an offensive program, it's prohibited. If it's done in order to enhance, say, a biological defense program, it's perfectly acceptable. And, and obviously then it is very difficult if you're just looking at an activity to make the distinction as to whether or not uh, what the intent of the person engaged in that activity is. There are some other key provisions, not unlike the CWC. Um, states parties are asked to take domestic measures to prevent banned activity, instill this, install this these notions, these prohibitions in domestic law. There is a consultation mechanism that can be done between states' parties, and ultimately complaints can be carried forward to the UN Security Council, although that has never happened. 
the U.S. alleged Soviet noncompliance with the BWC throughout the 1970s and 1980s. It never took the issue to the Security Council because it recognized that the, that the Soviet Union would veto any measure that, of action that the Security Council might be willing to take. And it also provides provisions for assistance, helping states parties uh, to acquire, to learn how to use the science and technology addressed by the treaty for peaceful purposes. And this has become a huge issue in the current negotiations. As I said, the problem is intent. On the one hand, it's very difficult to determine. And secondly, the BWC is only about a three-page document. It has no provisions for verification or enforcement. And that, from the very early on in the treaty's history, was a source of contention and has continued to be so and has led to some of the ongoing activities that we'll talk about. These activities have basically been centered around a series of review conferences that the treaty calls for that have been held about every five years. 1981, there was not much accomplished, but the issue of verification was put very much at the top of the agenda. A number of states went on record as saying, we've got to do something in this area. The U.S. traditionally promoted a different approach to this issue, arguing that the BWC is not verifiable and that it knew no way of making it verifiable, and therefore, what, rather than go down an unproductive road towards elaborating a, a unhelpful verification provisions, that in fact what was needed was more transparency, more sharing of information about activities that might be related to the core of the treaty. And that led in 1986 to a series of confidence building measures being agreed by the state's parties that had to do with declaring certain kinds of biological related activities. The problem was that these confidence building measures were voluntary and therefore you didn't get a very good record with respect to states going ahead and submitting the kinds of information that the confidence building measures requested. That being the case, we got, came to the 1991 review conference and this is a, an experience that I know very well because I led the U.S. delegation to this conference. It was convened in November after the Gulf War, and I think that, again, it con the, the Gulf War had concentrated the mind and, and put people in a very cooperative s spirit. We were able to get some additional confidence building measures agreed, despite the fact that we shared the disappointment of everybody else about the lack of uh, participation in those measures by most of the state's parties. And nevertheless, we were still arguing at that time that we did not think the treaty was verifiable and it would be a waste of time to go down that road. Not a lot of other countries agreed with us on this and therefore the issue of verification became the central issue at the review conference and has been in biological arms control since then. They, many of the other countries basically said some verification is better than none. The U.S. position was bad verification, which inevitably it would be, was worse than none. Kind of have difficult positions to reconcile, and yet in great diplomatic tradition, that's what they did. There was a compromise that was struck at the review conference that called for the creation of, an a, of a, a committee of experts, verification experts, what came to be called the Verex exercise. Their job was to identify potential verification measures but to look at them only from the scientific and technical viewpoint. They weren't to get into the politics of it or, or a variety of other things. I'm not sure that they, in fact, uh, adhered to that mandate. I think that it was a much looser exercise than those of us who had agreed to it from the U.S. side at the time really anticipated. Here at table two. Sir, you say that the U.S. had uh, said uh, bad verification is worse than none, but... Um in the early 90s, the, the Russians and the Americans uh, had, an, had a reciprocal verification where Ken Allaback and company came over here and we went over there. Are you going to get to that? Funny you should, okay. funny you should mention that. Um, at the same time, there were, in the late 1980s, 88 or 89, 
There was a defector that came out of the Soviet program and he went to Britain. Britain shared that information with us and eventually we got access to the defector who spilled the beans about the Soviet program. And it came as a shock to everybody with respect to the size and the uh, at level of effort that the Soviet program entailed. That being the case, it was very quickly elevated to senior, the, the highest political levels, including representations to Gorbachev by Mrs. Thatcher as prime minister, by at least our secretary of state, if not our president. He basically stonewalled during that period, 88, 90. At about that time, a second defector came out who reinforced these kinds of issues. The United States and Britain working with the Russians on a quiet basis tried to develop a procedure for dealing with these allegations in a situation, remember, in which the Soviet Union was collapsing. This led over a period of time to the, an agreement on a trilateral process between the Russians, the, U, the Brits, and us to try to get at the heart of these allegations. The problem was the Russians insisted that it be reciprocal. Whenever the U.S. made a, a public allegation about a Soviet violation, we would get one back in return. And, and in the, as part of an ongoing effort to create the sense of these are reciprocal concerns that exist with respect to our national programs. That being the case, the trilateral process involved then visits on the part of a joint U.S.-U.K. team to Soviet facilities, Russian facilities, Russian visits to British and US facilities. And they began by going to what were identified on, uh, when we went to the, the Russian side, to the biopreparat facilities, as opposed to the ones that had been traditionally part of the Russian military programs. And in fact, it didn't do very much to alleviate our concerns. I, there were a number of people involved in those visits who said they came back more concerned after than they were before. That was a little bit different than the Russian experience. And if you read Ken Alabek's book, he was part of the, the Soviet delegation that came over here. He had been hearing for decades that the US was engaged in a, an ongoing illegal offensive BW program. They went to people, places like Pine Bluff and so on. And one of the reasons Alabek ultimately defected was he realized that what he had been given was a line of hooey and that there was no U.S. program and no evidence of a U.S. program. And that was one of the reasons that contributed to his ultimate dissatisfaction with the system and his departure. Um, this process was ongoing until about 1995 when they got into the issue of w going on a reciprocal basis to military facilities and there the process basically broke down and stopped. And nothing really has been done on this trilateral basis since the mid-1990s. But the multilateral track was still going on and that included the work of the of Verex who concluded that no measure by itself would be able to verify the treaty but in combination a collection of measures might be able to be used to enhance confidence in compliance. That's very, uh, that's a very important formulation because it suggests that confidence in compliance may be enhanced, but it does not imply a standard of evidence that is the same that you would need to say that you were verifying compliance with the treaty. So what do they do with the Verex report? There was a special conference of states parties that is allowed for in the treaty. They convened in September 94 to consider it. And on the basis of the Verex report, they created the ad hoc group that was intended to, that, that was given a mandate to do four things. Look at definitions of terms. That was included on the insistence of the Russians look at confidence building measures and see whether more were needed. Should we make them uh, not voluntary but mandatory? Should we add some more? The keys though were the measures to enhance confidence and compliance to negotiate those and measures to enhance cooperation and assistance. The United States and the West insisting on 
the uh, compliance enhancements measures, basically the non-aligned movement insisting as payment for supporting the rest of it, focusing on issues related to cooperation and assistance. And these measures were to be incorporated into a legally binding protocol to the convention. The ad hoc group met 24 times beginning in 1994. One of the milestones was in July 97 when after everybody had, I mean, the, there was this sort of stew of ideas. They were brought together into a rolling text, not unlike what sort of uh, emerged in the chemical negotiations as the basis for ongoing negotiations. Problem was that the text was marked more by brackets, which signifies unagreed language, than it was by clean text that was agreed. So there was a huge job that they had going on from 97. Some of the critical issues that emerged from 97 until more recently had to do with, with several key issues. Part of it had to do with the fact that the approach they adopted was essentially one that was, had been outlined in the CWC. It was a CWC template, and not everybody recognized from the outset that it may not be appropriate to an apply a template that is applicable in one, for one set of science and technology to another, and yet that's what they did, and they set the basic parameters of the approach, the basic structure of the approach very early on and never went back and really scrutinized whether or not that was an appropriate thing to do, and therefore the debate became a debate over the details of provisions. And some of those details had to do with the, what would trigger a declaration, a requirement to make a declaration, and how much information should you include in those declarations. The United States was particularly concerned in this regard with respect to its biodefense activities. There was a big push for other countries, in a sense, to try to find out about as much about our program as they could while revealing as little as they could of their own. Obviously not something the United States found particularly positive. Um, what kinds of facilities should be captured? The problem with, with BW, as you know, is that it could be done in things, breweries, bakeries, dairy products, yogurt makers. Or are you going to have an inspection regime that goes to your local bakery or that goes to Coors Brewing Company or whatever the local Alabama company is? Because they've got exactly some of the same processes you can use to do biological weapons. So the issue was how do you create something that passes the laugh test with respect to not having to do that kind of thing? Big issue. Second thing was the nature of on-site activities. There was early agreement on what was called, to distinguish them from the CW side and inspections, investigations. And investigations were di divided into two categories. One were field investigations that would allow for the examination of alleged use of biological weapons or unusual outbreaks of disease. There was a second category of investigations that would be at suspect facilities, something of an analogy to the challenge inspection provisions of the Chemical Weapons Convention. But people wanted to go far beyond the investigation procedures to a whole series of other on-site activities. And the nature of those activities became the subject of a huge debate primarily within the Western group primarily between the United States and its European allies. Them wanting to do all kinds of things that the United States basically thought would not be terribly productive. Third issue was protection of confidential business information. And unlike in the chemical case, with respect to this negotiation, industry did not play a particularly helpful role. In fact, it is hard sometimes to estimate the rancor that existed between industry and the government officials on this issue at some times. It had its origin in the industry experience when the Russians came on their trilateral visit, and it got fairly ugly. So you didn't see the pharmaceutical industry and the biotechnology industry playing the same kind of positive role in these negotiations that you saw the chemical industry play in the um, chemical negotiations. Editorial comment, I know, but there it is. <laughs> 
And finally, there was a whole series of very dis tough issues with respect to cooperation and assistance. That was what the non-aligned was in this negotiation for. They didn't, many of them didn't care about biological weapons. They didn't feel threatened by biological weapons. What they wanted was cooperation and assistance. But some of them did it for purposes that would advance them economically. There was another group led by sort of the radical non-aligned that would, I would include in that uh, Iran, uh, Ch China, sort of, India, Pakistan, Cuba, who were using the requirement under Article 10 of the treaty for states to have to provide cooperation and assistance for peaceful purposes as a way to, to launch an attack against the existence of the Australia group as the export control system that covers biological equipment and materials. Essentially, that group of non-aligned, and they did it in the chemical context also, wanted to get rid of the Australia group. They wanted to get rid of national export control programs for whatever purpose. The argument they would use, obviously, was that export controls harmed their economic development, an argument that no data supports. And it became a huge issue in the course of the negotiation, and it continues to be an issue in the context of CWC implementation as well. They went so far as to suggest a provision that essentially would commit those countries who are members of the Australia group to disband the group, something that obviously they were not going to do. And that became an ongoing and incredibly bitter aspect of the negotiations. In March of this year, the chairman of the ad hoc group, Ambassador Tibor Toth from Hungary, who has unfortunately dealt with this all the way back to the review conference in 91, tabled a draft chairman's composite text in what he tried to do was provide a, put a clean text on the table that was free of brackets that represented, in essence, the grand compromise among the, the competing positions that remained in the negotiation. Uh, and, and what he tried to do through a whole series of consultations with all of the part, key participants in this process was to find a way to square the circle. At the 24th session of the ad hoc group in July of this year, the United States announced that it would reject the chairman's text. And not only would it reject the chairman's text as the basis for further negotiation, but it basically said the ad hoc group process is over. We don't see a great value in carrying this forward because the protocol as it has emerged is so badly flawed that it is unworkable and not worth pursuing. That's overstating it a little bit. Ambassador Maley, who is the U.S. head of the delegation and who's worked this issue for a long time, in fact, worked for me when I was in ACTA, uh, did it a lot more elegantly than that. But he basically said, this doesn't get the job done. It's never going to get the job done, and we should just put it aside. The U.S. then was criticized, saying, oh, this is the Bush administration walking away from another multilateral commitment. It wasn't that. If you look at the decisions the Bush administration has made on multilateral agreements, you can argue that they were made on the specifics of those. And, and we can talk about that if you want to. So I, I personally don't think that that was the case. The US was also accused of capitulating to industry pressure. Industry didn't want the text of the protocol as it emerged. It imposed too big a burden on them. It created too big a risk to confidential business information. That, too, is not true. And for those who have followed this issue and have seen the very unhelpful relationship between industry and government on this, actually find it kind of amusing that they would lay the blame for the US decision at the feet of industry. Industry wasn't particularly helpful, but I don't think that it was the Bush administration capitulating to industry pressure. I do think that they did evaluate. There was a, a review process when the Bush administration came in. Remember, this was negotiated by the Clinton administration largely. Uh, they came in, took a look at where, the, especially after the chairman dropped his text on the table in March, and they concluded that in this case, something is not better than nothing. 
which was the argument you were hearing from the Uni Europeans and the other supporters of the protocol. Well, we need something. Something is better than nothing. Basically, the U.S. answer to that was wrong. The United States had identified 38 concerns about the chairman's text that if there were changes involved, and the other supporters of the protocol, well, we need something. Something is better than nothing. Basically, the U.S. answer to that was wrong. The United States had identified 38 concerns about the chairman's text that if there were changes involved, they might have been able to support the text. These were red lines for the U.S. And they shared these concerns both with their allies and with the chairman before the text, his text was put on the table. The chairman's text addressed exactly one of those 38 concerns. So you could see why the U.S. was a little disappointed. The United States also felt that it was, I don't, uh, betrayed might be too strong a word, but that it didn't get the support that it felt it was going to from some of our European allies. And, and in fact, there are some very weak provisions. Um, I don't know if, if you all, I did a report on this. Um, we got some, actually some money from a private foundation to look at the protocol as it was evolving. And we did a report that came out about three weeks before the US decision. It's a copy for your library, if anybody is interested. Uh, we basically made the same arguments that the US did in this report, that the protocol didn't get the job done, that it was seriously flawed conceptually, that, that it, it took an approach that given the, what bio, biological weapons are, what the biological sciences are, where biotechnology and, and advanced microbiology are going, it wasn't going to get the job done. The job being dealing with the proliferation of biological weapons which is the core goal of the BWC. It had a lot of stuff about activities and visits. The problem was we weren't going to be visiting any of the countries of concern if they signed up. It had an awful lot of stuff to do with cooperation and assistance and some very good things that in and of themselves, like enhancing global disease surveillance, are very important. But whether they should have been paired together in an essentially a security agreement, and given the kind of shape and prominence that they did in that agreement, I think, um, was, was not justifiable. So the bottom line, there are serious conceptual flaws in the draft protocol, at least according to my view. And for that, I'm probably going to be stripped of my arms control uh, eagles and drummed out of the arms control corps. But yes, sir, at table six. I just got done doing my um, paper, as a matter of fact, on the biopreparate. And um, based on some of the research I did, I would argue that the, <laughs> you know, there was a flaw in this process from the beginning. Because, you know, from Secretary of Defense Laird's push to get Nixon to sign on unilaterally to this convention. They compromised, I think, um, in areas that I thought they should not have, in that Russia, not Russia, but USSR, initially would not sign on until they withdrew the whole, and, and I'm not, this is what I read, until we agreed, both the US and Britain agreed, to pull the inspection requirement out of the treaty. Is that, is that true? Because I, that's I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if that, was, that that was the case. We agreed because Laird and Kissinger wanted Nixon to seem you know, like a statesman, so they, didn't, they wanted to get an agreement as quickly as possible, for more for political reasons. And there's a whole series of other information that went along with that, that kind of said, we didn't do this because out of the goodness of our heart, there was a political agenda there. And I think the Russians kind of just went along because for two reasons. One, 
they knew because of the difficulty you alluded to with the dual use that there was no way the U.S. would be able or the world would be able to find out that they were actually cheating. And then, of course, we signed on with the, without that requirement for the um, on-site protocol. So now, when we have more people and organizations to deal with, we're trying to fix that. I think we should have fixed it back in 1971. Well, but I, I think your, your point is probably correct, but I, I, I think it's important to look at it in terms of what it tells us about arms control as an artifact of its time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what I mean by that is in 1969 to 72, mm -hmm. when the Biological Weapons Convention was being negotiated, whether it was between us and the Russians or ultimately in the multilateral arena, on-site activity was virtually unknown in arms control. At that point, the only means of verification for whatever arms control treaties existed, and as there weren't very many in 1969. I mean, there were arms control agreements at, at that point that were relatively meaningless. I mean, we're not going to deploy nuclear weapons in the seabed or outer space or the Antarctica Treaty. I mean, that, yeah, anybody could agree to those. But arms control agreements that imposed meaningful obligations and usually in the form of restrictions, on the parties to those, with the exception of the NPT, which was negotiated and I think entered into force in 65, their on-site activity was not a part of arms control. And, and, and it was the breakthrough of on-site activity in the INF agreement, which came in the mid-1980s, that, that, that generally allowed for the principle of on-site activity to be incorporated into subsequent arms control agreements. Up to that time, verification depended exclusively on national technical means. And so in, the, in that historical context, it is not surprising to my mind that you were going to get the Russians to agree, the Soviets to agree, to on-site inspection because they had never agreed to any kind of on-site verification activities. And so in this context, I, I agree with you about the political agenda that the Nixon administration had and all of that. But also arms control, despite the fact that the currency of arms control are things military, what you have to appreciate is that arms control is the quintessential political activity. And it, engage, it requires, and as, as politics, it is about the art of the possible. And if you want an objective, for whatever reason, you're going to have to compromise to get it. And, and, it was, and it has only, in a way, become more complicated, which is why I think the whole issue of technical cooperation and assistance that the non-aligned state so advocates has really complicated this, because they have made that their price to get some of these other things. And we are trying to pay a price in a way that we can find acceptable, and we haven't been able to do that yet. And, and so what arms control, especially in the multilateral agreement, is about, is not about picking between good options and bad options, or even it's about picking between bad options and worse options. It's about balancing interests. And, and I think these agreements are good ones, because you've got national security interests, you've got trade interests, you've got commercial interests, you've got public interests, you've got health interests. And, and what you're trying to do is find a way to balance those things in a multilateral setting that everyone can agree to. And so I, I think you have to, and, and that is why arms control as it was practiced during the Cold War and as, as it has been conducted at the end of the Cold War making that transition out, which we see in things like CFE, and the CWC into the post-Cold War environment where you get things like the BWC protocol negotiations or the small arms work that the UN is doing and some other things. Arms control is evolving as the international environment evolves and, and is trying to find a, a mode of doing its business that is appropriate to that historical point in time. I don't, th and, and the BWC protocol I think is a good example of it not achieving that objective, because it is using a construct from an older time 
to deal with an issue of today. And that's why, um, sort of let me, let me finish. I think this is the last slide, so it's a great lead-in to this. Uh, there is a review conference of the BWC scheduled for this November and December. The U.S. is going to be expected, because it said it would when it made its rejection statement, that it would table some new ideas. And there is a lot of concern about the nature of those ideas and how the other partners in this process will react. Uh, there is a concern that, that people are so bitter after six years of negotiation and the UN basically sending this thing down the tubes that regardless of what the U.S. puts on the table, they're going to reject it. It doesn't matter how good it is, how bad it is, it's not going to be acceptable just to get back at the U.S. Others concern, are concerned that there will be a package of relatively weak measures that essentially constitute window dressing. This was a view that was expressed to me by the French. Uh, last week in Paris. I think there is the question, how has this whole situation been changed by the events of September 11th? Because we're in a new context and we may have to find a new way to do our business. And that leads me to the final point, which was a point that was reinforced when we uh, did our report, my, when we did the report, we have a, in Washington, we sponsor an ongoing breakfast series of meetings under the rubric of responding to the BW challenge, and it's covered the waterfront. We've had over 50 meetings in this series over the last five or six years. Um, we had one of the meetings in that series the day the U.S. made its rejection, and it was presenting my report. But the interesting thing I thought about it was that while there wasn't universal consensus among the participants, and this is a group of people, administration people, Congress, uh, Hill staffers, industry, scientists, non-governmental experts, a, a real sort of cross-section of the people who follow this that there was, I think, a sense generally shared by most of the participants at the meeting that we had to fundamentally rethink the way we do our biological arms control business. That the old structures of the kind of multilateral, large multilateral negotiations of the kind that produced the protocol are not likely to be effective in this context, especially in an environment in which we are confronting profound scientific and technological changes. People are talking about we're standing on the verge of a biotechnology revolution and that the 21st century will be the century of biology. Whatever it was the protocol produced wouldn't be able to deal with that kind of situation. And so we have to find a new way to do our business. And that business is finding a means of shape, and this is what, how I see arms control. Arms control is about shaping expectations and behaviors and political relationships by addressing the security dimension of, of states' relationships and the tools by which, some of the tools at, at least, by which that security relationship is conducted. And, and that's why it deals, by and large, with weapons. So what we have to do is rethink the way we, we address the problem of biological weapons as a means to shape expectations and political behaviors. I did promise the Australia group. Um, I'm not sure. We only have one minute, so it's pretty effective as far as it goes, but in the biological area in particular, export controls are going to become less and less meaningful as the kind of knowledge we're talking about becomes more and more available on a global basis for perfectly legitimate reasons, to enhance human health, to enhance agriculture, to do all those other things. But there is a dark side to it, and our export control approaches isn't going to be able to keep up with it. There are problems with the Australia group, but maybe next time I'll have a more disciplined presentation and I can cover it uh, if you have me back. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it.